Hello everyone, this is Joshua Smith of Apollo's Artifacts. It is now June of 2019. In this episode, we're going to be taking a look at the False Memory Syndrome Foundation and a reading list that they have suggested for people who come to their website. We're going to look at some of the titles to find out how academically neutral and objective and dispassionate they are in the titling of their books. This is going to be yet another entry in the Satanic Panic Reconsidered series that I've been working on. It's quickly developing into one of the most in-depth and extensive investigations that I've ever done since I started the show. Part of my motivation for beginning this entire series was that I had heard a number of accounts given recently that seemed to, in my mind anyway, drastically misrepresent the period of the 1980s that generally makes up what is called the Satanic Panic Period which I would say probably runs from about uh, maybe 1980 to 83 and ended somewhere in the early 1990s, say 91, 92, maybe 93 if you stretch it a little bit. But primarily I just want to set the historical record straight because I think that there are a number of mischaracterizations, inaccuracies, even outright falsehoods that are taken as a fact today that are absolutely not fact. And among the primary participants in this would be this list that is offered as a reading list from the False Memory Syndrome Foundation. It's basically a who's who's list of denialists. And I am not here going to charge that every single person mentioned on this list is acting in bad faith. Indeed, I think that many of them actually believe the things that they claim. However, I think that almost every single one of them in one way or another engages in a certain amount of mischaracterization and misidentification, and some actually lie. However, I have to point out that that actually takes place on the other side as well, because really this thing has broken down into these all-or-nothing polarities. You know, it's really um, sort of a bivalent dichotomy that has emerged, you know, where you have the dominant narrative is the witch hunt narrative or the satanic panic mythos, and on the other side you have a minority position which is held by what some would probably characterize as rather extreme Christians who will make outrageous uh, statements like 50 to 60,000 babies are kidnapped and murdered per year and they have their heads cut off and their blood drained and people are drinking the blood and all of this sort of stuff, you know. But really to make those claims, you actually need to produce some bodies first before people can believe that kind of thing. I don't think we should all be expected to think that all of the bodies are incinerated and there's no evidence left over afterward. That being said, I think that the people who have constructed the Satanic Panic Mythos are actually committing the greater wrongs here because the wrongs are actually against children who are real victims. Because that's the thing that we need to look out for first and most rather than adults here and there who may end up being accused falsely of something that they did not do. The FMSF um, organization was actually set up by people who claim to have been falsely accused by their own daughter. Their daughter still sticks by the story today that she says that her father uh, had massively abused her when she was young, but then the mother refused to believe her story. Either way, um, they set up this organization, and it um, has a number of questionable people who have been associated with it over the years, such as Ralph Underwager, who I've covered in an earlier episode. But what we want to do here is um, look into some of the authors and look at the hyperbolic titles that they used, which today we would basically uh, refer to as clickbait. They didn't refer to it as that then because they're just trying to move books and whatnot. But you can develop a kind of uh, toolkit of terminology from this, you know, that are like uh, buzz words and buzz phrases that you'll see come up over and over again. And that will be a tip off to tell you if you're dealing with somebody who's associated with this or who buys hook, line, and sinker the witch hunt narrative, or satanic panic mythos. And you can be the judge for yourself um, whether or not you think that these are people operating with an ingrained bias or if they are maintaining an appropriate level of objectivity towards the subject. So we begin here with 1999, Joan Asosel, Creating Hysteria, Women and Multiple Personality Disorder. So there we have hysteria right out of the gates. Next, we have an edited volume by Paul Applebaum, 1996, Trauma and Memory, Clinical and Legal Controversies. That's a perfectly acceptable title, very objective. 
Next is Elliot Aronson and Carol Travis's 2007 Mistakes Were Made But Not By Me, Why We Justify Foolish Beliefs, Bad Decisions, and Hurtful Acts. And there we have foolish beliefs. So they're going to be the arbiters to tell you what are foolish beliefs and what are not. This is another thing that you'll notice from these people who are associated with the capital S skeptics or psychop and things like that is they're going to tell you what things are weird and what is not weird and what you can think and what you're not allowed to think. Next we have 1992 Robert Baker Hidden Memories Voices and Visions from Within. Next Richard Beck 2015 We Believe the Children A Moral Panic in the 1980s. So he's characterized it there as the moral panic and this is one of the buzzword terms that make some nincompoops think that they're smart when they repeat the phrase. Next, 2009, Mikhail Borch Jakobsen, Making Minds and Madness from Hysteria to Depression. So there we have madness and hysteria showing up once again. Next, we have 1994, Terrence Campbell, Beware the Talking Cure. Psychotherapy may be hazardous to your mental health. Although psychotherapy and talking therapy seems to be one of the best ways to go, according to many studies that I've read, which is much better than taking pills, which literally chemically rewires your brain, you'd probably want to avoid that as much as possible. Next, we have Terrence Campbell's 1998 Smoke and Mirrors, The Devastating Effect of False Sexual Abuse Claims. Now, I wonder if anyone tried to interview Terrence Campbell about Dr. Christine Blasey Ford's accusations against Brett Kavanaugh. One of the things that I noticed when I looked this up is a number of people associated with the False Memory Syndrome Foundation actually came down on the side of Dr. Christine Blasey Ford's accusations against Kavanaugh because they're leftists, not because they actually believe what she's saying. And one of the things that's interesting is when you look into her past, she has been involved in hypnotherapy, hypnosis, self-hypnosis, where you can actually supposedly induce these memories, just the very thing that the False Memory Syndrome Foundation was set up to try to combat, where this, uh, this idea of implanted memories, implanted false memories and whatnot. And they always say that you have to have corroborating evidence, which I agree with, but they, you know, Dr. Christine Blasey Ford was unable to turn up any corroborating evidence against Kavanaugh whatsoever. All the people who she said were at the party said they couldn't remember it. Even her own friends backed out and said, hey, we don't remember seeing the guy and you together and all this sort of stuff. There's nothing that supports or backs up her story in any way whatsoever. But yet, people associated with the False Memory Syndrome Foundation are like, oh yes, she gets the imprimatur of truth marked on her. Next, we have Susan Clancy's 2009 The Trauma Myth, The Truth About the Sexual Abuse of Children and Its Aftermath. I think it's quite a stretch to imply that uh, trauma leaving marks behind is a myth. I think we've all known a number of people in our own lives who have had particular traumas, and it does uh, have echoing effects throughout the entire rest of their lives, sometimes in very, very unfortunate ways. I've known a number of people who have suffered such things. Next, we have 1995, Frederick Cruz, The Memory Wars, Freud's Legacy and Dispute. And Frederick Cruz is another one of these people who you'll see pop up over and over again, supporting the idea that um, nothing in the satanic panic ever actually took place or that massive amounts of uh, child sexual abuse did not take place. I've even seen him defending, I believe it was Mark Pendergrast who has made claims that Jerry Sandusky actually did not uh, commit the horrendous amounts of child sexual abuse that basically everybody else knows Sandusky actually did. So it's it's pretty amazing how this uh, ilk of people orbit one another over and over and over, and they will co-cite one another over and over and over. 1994, Robin Dawes. House of Cards, Psychology and Psychiatry Built on Myth. There we have myth popping up again. 1998, Theodore Sarbin and Joseph de Rivera's Believed in Imaginings. My goodness, get that. Believed in Imaginings, the Narrative Construction of Reality. And of course, this is exactly what Professor Ross Chite is aiming at when he talks about the witch hunt narrative, is that this constructed reality, so-called reality of the past, by the people who have made this satanic panic mythos are causing you to believe things that are not entirely true. 1998, here again we have another one of those. Tana Deneen's Manufacturing Victims. What the psychology industry is doing to people. 
So we have a psychology industry here. We have manufactured victims. And since we're following alphabetical order here, I'm going to go to Paul Eberle's 1993 Abuse of Innocence, the McMartin Preschool Trial, which gets right to the heart of the entire matter. So let's jump out just for a moment and take a look at Paul Eberly and his wife, shall we? Just going to read a short section here from an article that I will link below by Maria Lorena. Paul and Shirley Eberly, a strange pair of experts. Paul and Shirley Eberly wrote The Politics of Child Abuse, a book that accuses mothers, mental health professionals, and prosecutors of feeding children stories about sexual abuse. Since the book was published by Lyle Stewart in 1986, the Eberleys have been cited as experts in sexual abuse trials. They were featured speakers at a conference of the Victims of Child Abuse Laws, or VOCAL, a group formed to protect accused parents. So this VOCAL group is very similar to the FMSF. And one of the things that you'll notice is a number of the other journalists who work in this area and even the academics will repeatedly cite the Eberleys as if they are somehow academic level experts on this particular topic. So the article continues here. What is startling about the Eberleys' reputation as groundbreaking experts in the field is that their dubious credentials have not been widely challenged. Paul and Shirley Eberly edit a soft core magazine in California called the LA Star that contains a mixture of nude photos, celebrity gossip, telephone sex ads, and promos for the politics of child abuse. In the 1970s, however, the Eberleys were also publishing hardcore pornography. Their publication, Finger, which you can look up a number of those online, I warn you against that, by the way, depicted scenes of bondage, S&M, and sexual activities involving urination and defecation. And we also see this coming up, of course, in the Frank Fuster case and a number of the other cases, is that these people have this fascination with S&M and feces and urine and whatnot. Uh, you also see this with Alfred Kinsey. A young girl portrayed with a wide smile on her face sits on top of a man whose private is inside of her. A woman has relations with a young boy in a drawing entitled, quote, Memories of My Boyhood. The Eberleys were featured nude on one cover holding two life-size blow-up dolls named Love Girl and Play Guy. No dates appear on the issues, and the Eberleys rarely attach their names, referring to themselves as the L.A. Star family. The Eberleys were distributors of Finger and several other underground magazines, says Donald Smith, a sergeant with the obscenity section of the Los Angeles Police Department's vice division, who followed the couple for years. LAPD was never able to prosecute for child pornography. Quote, There were a lot of photos of people who looked like they were underage, but we could never actually prove it. The pictures of young children in Finger are illustrations, and child pornography laws were less rigid a decade ago than they are today. Among the titles of the articles, Sex Pot at 5, My First Rape, She Was Only 13, and What Happens When, I won't say this word, N-Words Adopt White Children, are some of the articles that appear in Finger. One letter states, quote, I think it's really great that your mags have the courage to print articles and pics on child sex. Too bad I didn't hear from more women who are into child sex. Since I'm single, I'm not getting it on with my children but I know of a few families that are. If I were married and my wife and kids approved, I'd be having sex with my daughters. End quote. Yikes. So that's the Eberly cited here as a good and reliable source for additional reading from the False Memory Syndrome Foundation. Let's continue here and I'll skip around just a bit. I'll have this link below so you can check it out for yourself. 1992, Kevin Farmer, Eleanor Goldstein's Confabulations, Creating False Memories, Destroying Families. So we have confabulations, creating false memories. So we have the idea of a manufacturer or the industry concept once again popping up. 1993, Felicity Goodyear-Smith, First Do No Harm, The Sexual Abuse Industry. Again, it's referred to as an industry. Things are just created, they're made up, they're manufactured, nothing's real, etc., etc., 1996, Richard Gilliatt, Talk of the Devil, Repressed Memory and the Ritual Abuse Witch Hunt. So there we have it officially in writing in 96 as a witch hunt once again. I find the next one from 1997 particularly interesting considering how it's one of those that 
is a self-imploding argument. It comes right back around towards the FMSF itself. Margaret Hagen's Whores of the Court, the Fraud of Psychiatric Testimony and the Rape of American Justice. And one of the things that I found here in just a, a cursory overview is that some of the people associated with the FMSF very frequently testify in court doing the exact same thing. They're hired guns. They're literally whores of the court, just as this uh, book says. Like uh, Richard Offshee, I, I found that he had testified in more than 340 cases similar to this, you know, trying to say that um, occult ritualistic abuse doesn't take place or satanic abuse doesn't take place or that uh, the nursery or daycare center type abuses never actually took place, so on and so forth. Same thing for Ralph Underwager. I found that he testified more than 300 times. Uh, same thing with Elizabeth Loftus, who's another one of the primary contributors to this whole thing. She had more than 150 testimonies that she had given, you know, just another hired gun flying around all over the world to testify on behalf of people who are supposedly falsely accused. Also 1997... Myra Johnston, Spectral Evidence, the Ramona case. So spectral evidence there makes you think of, I guess, uh, ghosts or ghostbusters or something like that. You know, it slimed me and all this kind of stuff. 1994, Catherine Ketchum and Elizabeth Loftus, who I just mentioned. The Myth of Repressed Memory. So there we have myth showing up once again. 2003, Jeffrey Lohr, Stephen Lynn, Scott Lilienfeld. Science and Pseudoscience in Clinical Psychology. So this is, a, again, a common term you see coming from the capitalist skeptics, from the debunker crowd, from PSYCOP, and so on. They're going to tell you what is real science and what is pseudoscience and what is real history and what is pseudo-history. And basically, they just rule out anything that they don't like. I mean, it's just like talking to a leftist about some kind of a political issue. It's just, you know, far-right extremist is anything that a leftist doesn't agree with, you know. So anything a skeptic doesn't agree with is, you know, pseudo this, that, and the other. They even have one here that stretches uh, f far back in time, if the date is accurate. 1856, Charles McKay's Extraordinary popular delusions and the madness of crowds. So we have popular delusions and madness worked in there. In 1995, we have Debbie Nathan making another appearance. I've discussed her in a previous episode. Co-author Michael Snedeker, who was one of the defense uh, team members. Satan's silence, ritual abuse, and the making of a modern American witch hunt. So there we have the witch hunt narrative material popping up again. Satan's silence, of course, is a reference to how Satan was never there, and there was no occult or ritualistic anything ever involved. Not to worry, go back to sleep, etc. 1994, Ethan Waters and Richard Offshay, who I've mentioned before, making monsters, false memory, psychotherapy, and sexual hysteria. So we have false memory, hysteria, the creation or manufacturing or industry uh, motive again with the monsters and so on also. Offshe is also said to have, uh, by certain researchers, rather extensive connections to the CIA. 1996, Mark Pendergrast, Victims of Memory, Sex Abuse Accusations and Shattered Lives. 1997, August Piper, Hoax and Reality, The Bizarre World of Multiple Personality Disorder. So we have Bizarre thrown in there, Hoax thrown in there. 1997, Harrison Pope, Psychology Astray, Fallacies and Studies of, quote, Repressed Memory and Childhood Trauma. So this is saying there's no such thing as any repressed memories that may pop up later on. It's fallacies, which is referring to logic, and he's probably wrong in his application of the term there. 2003, Dorothy Rabinowitz, No Crueler Tyrannies, Accusations, False Witness, and Other Terrors of Our Times. 1997, we have Michael Shermer making his appearance here. Of course, he is of the capital S skeptic and debunker variety, uh, former associated with PSYCOP and so on. It'll, why people believe weird things, pseudoscience, superstition, and other confusions of our time. So Michael's going to tell you what confusions and what are superstitions and what pseudoscience is and how people just happen to believe weird things. So he's going to, you know, call balls and strikes there, ruling in and out what is weird and what isn't weird, and he's the arbiter of what's weird and what is not weird for you. 
and uh, Michael's not so bad when it comes to certain political issues and whatnot. He he's uh, really big on calling out the political left for some of their lunacy that's been taking place lately. But what you see so many times with these skeptics is they they basically pronounce or make proclamations about what's weird and what isn't weird, and you know you're not really allowed to uh, go outside of those barriers that they'll set for you. 1997, Elaine Showalter, Histories, Hysterical Epidemics, and Modern Media. So now do we not only have hysteria working its way in again, but we also have that these hysterias are epidemics. 1995, Jonja Lalich and Margaret Singer's Crazy Therapies. Boy, that's really an unbiased and non-polemical title for you. That wouldn't be complete clickbait material. Maybe I should label this episode crazy therapies or something maybe people will click on it for that 1995 susan smith's survivor psychology the dark side of mental health mission so we have the dark side showing up there 1999 an edited work with sheila taub recovered memories of child sexual abuse psychological social and legal perspectives on a contemporary mental health controversy that's a perfectly good title. That That is really what they ought to be aiming for, I would think. 1994, we have Ralph Underwager and his wife, Holida Wakefield. Return of the Furies, analysis of recovered memory therapy. And, of course, the controversies of Mr. Underwager are well documented here. 1995, Jeffrey Victor's Satanic Panic, the creation of a contemporary legend. So there we have the, the full bore thing coming right at you. Satanic panic, and it's a legend. You know, he's going to tell you that it's an urban myth, and it's all just a bunch of falsehoods and crazy people, and oh my goodness, how did this happen? It has to be the religious right. They're just out of control. We have to do something about them. 1995, Claudette Wassel Grimm. You have one of those good uh, female double-barreled last names there that you get so much when you're in academia. They were all over the place when I was there, by the way. Diagnosis for disaster. So we have disaster here. 1994, Lawrence writes, Remembering Satan, Case of Recovered Memory and the Shattering of an American Family. So we have shattering and we have remembering Satan, Satan's silence. 1995, this is uh, one that comes up repeatedly in Professor Ross Chite's book as he talks about this group of academics, um, Maggie Brook and Stephen C.C.'s Jeopardy in the Courtroom, a Scientific Analysis of Children's Testimony. 1992, Richard Gardner, True and False Accusations on Child Sexual Abuse. At least he admits that there are actually true accusations. 1998, Catherine Lyon, Witch Hunt, a true story of social hysteria and abused justice. My goodness, it's all there, huh? Witch Hunt, social hysteria, abused justice. I just sense so much is uh, disingenuine from this crowd. I mean, not, not everybody, of course, but so many of them. It just seems like they have all these other agendas that are in operation. And again here, I'm not saying that the False Memory Syndrome Foundation is uh, entirely corrupt or completely evil to its core or anything like that. I know there are people out there who do say that kind of thing, but that isn't really the claim that I'm making here. I'm just uh, really wanting to point out the hyperbolic titles and show that they're, you know, there's just lacking so much in objectivity and uh, you know the sort of typical neutrality that you would want to expect from good ac academic work and research and how you would write the books and so forth. There is much, much more work to be done on this whole thing of the Satanic Panic Reconsidered series that I'm working on, and I hope to continue to delve into it. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to like, subscribe, and share. Thank you.